The Aeneid was written by Virgil, that guy from the Inferno, around 30 BC, and it was meant to serve as a sort of continuation to the Iliad and the Odyssey, both written by Homer more than 800 years previously. Virgil was commissioned to write the piece by Caesar Augustus, who demanded that the poet write him a kick-ass power ballad glorifying him. Virgil, on the other hand, was a clever bastard who didn't like Augustus all that much, and opted instead to write an epic glorifying Rome, while surreptitiously mocking Augustus the whole time. Our hero Aeneas is meant to parallel Augustus in action in certain key events, to serve as a sort of historical insert character for the Caesar. This might be why Aeneas is described as a really swell guy, but in practice acts like rather a knobhead. So, our story begins shortly after the events of the Trojan War, where we see Hera absolutely losing it and raging against the Trojans. Strangely enough, not because of their actions in the war itself, but instead because there is... A prophecy. <laughs> That's right. Apparently, it was foretold that not only would Troy survive the aggressive tan the Achaeans gave it, but it would live on as an immensely powerful empire in Italy, known as Rome. Hera objects to this because the prophecy also states that the Romans will bring about the destruction of Carthage, which is her favorite city. Anyway, we learn that an intrepid young hero has managed to escape the flames of Troy and is sailing for Italy, known back then as Hesperia, along with a whole fleet of refugees. This hero is Aeneas, who you may remember as having been an immensely unimportant player in the Iliad. He was that guy that Aphrodite dropped when Diomedes shot a spear through her wrist. But Aeneas carries the distinction of being Aphrodite's son as well as Rome's favorite hero and ancestral founder, so I guess he's the hero of this tale. So anyway, Hera, or as the Romans called her, Juno, is having none of this Aeneas surviving nonsense and calls upon King Aeolus for help. As you may recall, Aeolus appeared briefly in the Odyssey. He was that king who gave Odysseus that magic bag of wind, and Juno bribes him with the offer of a sexy nymph wife if he unleashes the fury on Aeneas' fleet. Aeolus, amazingly, turns down the offer of steamy Nariad loving, but for some reason still does as she asks, and Aeneas' fleet is devastated by the resulting hurricane. But this, in turn, pisses off Poseidon. Oh. I'm sorry. I meant Neptune. God, this is more confusing than those stupid Percy Jackson books. Anyway, yeah, Neptune is all like, The, the only, only deity, deity who gets, gets to make life unnecessarily complex for a hero of the Trojan War is me! And banishes the storm, leaving the damaged Trojan fleet to sail to a port in Libya. Neptune then presumably went back to tossing Cyclopses at Odysseus. So Aeneas manages to dock his fleet, and then he gives a nice little rousing speech to the rather disheartened Trojans, although he's mostly talking out of his ass, as he has no idea where they are, or really where they're supposed to be going. So Aphrodite, alias Venus, sees her darling boy having so much trouble being so perfect and beautiful all the time, and runs off to Zeus, aka Jove, and is like, Dad and or nephew, it's just not fair! Why did you let Troy get all smashed up? Where's my baby boy supposed to live now? And Jove slash Zeus is like, Fear not, my daughter and or auntie, for you see, there is a prophecy. <laughs> So, Jove explains that Aeneas is destined to lead to the founding of Rome, the most kick-ass of all empires ever. Clearly, they did not yet have a prophecy regarding the founding of America. So, Venus drops down to Earth, disguised as a huntress, to give Aeneas directions to the nearest city, which happens to be Carthage, ruled by Queen Dido. If that name sounds at all familiar, she showed up in Dante's Inferno in the second circle of hell. So, yeah, I'm sure this story is gonna go great for her. So, Aeneas and the Trojan refugees head to Carthage, where Queen Dido happily invites them to rest up, offers to repair their ships, and even suggests that if they need a place to stay, Carthage is always open to them. Then Dido was like, oh, Aeneas, want to tell us some of your awesome adventures over dinner, but not at all like Odysseus did when he reached Phaeacia? And Aeneas is like, sure thing, babe. It all started shortly before my city caught fire. So Aeneas recounts the final days of the Trojan War, which really started getting interesting when the Trojan army roared into the Greek camp, only to find it entirely deserted, save for an enormous wooden horse and a lone Greek kid named Sinon, or Sinon who they promptly capture. Sinon claims that the Greek army ran off, leaving him behind as a sacrifice to appease the gods so they'd let them set sail. Fans of Iphigenia will note that this is, in fact, a strategy that the Greeks have employed previously, to great effect and with absolutely no negative consequences. Anyway, they ask about the horse, and Sinon is like, that is an extremely complicated monument to Athena. Be careful, if you damage the statue at all, she'll get pissed and strike you down with great vengeance. On the other hand, if you take it into your city, she'll favor you, and next time you'll beat the Greeks for sure. So the Trojan king Priam is like, seems legit, and they drag the horse into town. Before I go any further, there's an interesting bit of symbolism to note. The Trojan horse is described as a monument to Athena, and in a strange way, it is. Athena is the goddess of wisdom, yes, but she's also a goddess of war. As such, her cunning is often manifested into complex strategy and avoiding direct confrontation, as opposed to the manifestation of war that Ares represented, which was rather more brute force and ignorance. So, while the use of the Trojan horse is seen as a deceitful tactic, it is undeniably a valid strategy, and a brilliant one at that. In this way, it really is a tribute to Athena. Okay, that's it for the analysis part. Write your own damn paper. Anywho, yeah, the Trojan horse turns out to have been full of bloodthirsty Greeks. Spoiler alert, by the way. So Aeneas, faced with the prospect of his beloved city being turned into a flaming war zone, does the heroic thing, and runs very far in the opposite direction. Our hero, everybody. Well, that's not entirely true, he does put up a pretty good fight. Then he runs into Helen, and considers brutally murdering her for events entirely beyond her control. Our hero, everybody. But Venus convinces him not to kill Helen, explaining that the war and the ruin of Troy weren't actually her fault. You're goddamn right it wasn't her fault, Venus. It wasn't her fault because it was your fault for kidnapping her in the first place. Helen hasn't done a damn thing in this entire stupid epic cycle! <sighs>
Anyway. Aeneas flees the battlefield and builds a fleet to escape. Then he goes island hopping until eventually reaching the foreign safe haven of Carthage. And if that sounds eerily reminiscent of the entire first half of the Odyssey, well, it should. Here are the only important things that happen along the way. Apollo, whoops, I mean, uh, oh, I actually do mean Apollo. Anyway, Apollo is like, yo, Aeneas, go fulfill the prophecy. <laughs> and sends him to the land of his ancestors, that is, Italy. Which isn't a thing yet, so Aeneas is rather confused as to where he's really supposed to go. Aeneas manages to get cursed by a harpy, who dooms him to be unable to find Italy until the crew gets so hungry that they have to eat their own tables. Oddly specific. The text does not elaborate on why exactly the Trojans didn't attempt a little table nibbling whenever they were having trouble finding the stupid place. Aeneas, on his way to Scylla and Charybdis, lands on the island of the Cyclops, where he runs into Agmenides. If the name sounds unfamiliar, that's because he didn't exist before Virgil retroactively wrote him into the Odyssey, where supposedly he was one of Odysseus' crew members. And because Aeneas is just so perfect, of course he takes him on board, despite the fact that Achmenides is a Greek and therefore one of the enemy. Anyway, that's pretty much the end of Aeneas' story. Yeah, he didn't bother recounting how he made it past Scylla and Charybdis. Guess it was just that easy for him. Ugh. So Dido finds herself falling in love with Aeneas, but she's all conflicted and stuff because after her husband Sicaius died, she swore she'd never love again. But Juno once again spots a golden opportunity to keep the Trojans from reaching Italy. If she can get Aeneas to stay in Carthage with Dido, she won't have to worry. So she schemes to exploit the one thing that Venus is vulnerable to. Playing matchmaker. Yeah, that's right. Venus knows Juno is playing her, but she just can't resist the urge to set her son up with a sexy foreign queen. Christ, okay. I'll spare you the gory details. Suffice to say that with both Juno and Venus conspiring to set Dido and Aeneas up together, they carry on a whirlwind romance and immediately get sort of married. So Aeneas relaxes in luxury for a while. Hey, just like Odysseus, how about that? But Jove gets antsy with all this loafing around and sends Hermes... Yeah, no, they use Hermes in the text. So Jove sends Hermes down to give Aeneas a verbal kick in the rear to get him back on track to fulfilling... The prophecy. So Hermes pops down and sasses Aeneas back into action, and Aeneas immediately resolves to sneak away so he won't have to explain his actions to his wife. Because that would be awkward? Well, it doesn't matter anyway, since Dido catches him trying to sneak off and demands he explain himself. So he's like, but Dido, I can't stay with you. I have to fulfill the prophecy. So Aeneas runs off and Dido commits an impressively over-the-top suicide. So first, she sets herself on fire along with all of Aeneas' possessions, and then she stabs herself with his sword. Then with her dying breath, she declares that the Carthaginians will forever be at war with Aeneas' people. Ooh, I covered this in my Roman Republic video. This is reference to the Punic Wars that the Romans and the Carthaginians fought no. in the second- No! Oh god, not the face! My video! Aeneas, having sailed away during all the commotion, lands on the shores of Sicily and in light of this recent and terrible tragedy, holds funeral games. For his father, because it's his one-year death anniversary. Way to prioritize your loved ones, jackass. So, while the men are engaging in those healthy, sporting, and 100% heterosexual activities, Juno sneakily persuades the Trojan women, who by now are rather sick of all this sailing nonsense, to burn their ships, so that instead of continuing to search for Italy, they'll be forced to settle in Sicily instead. This is actually a pretty great idea. So the ladies set the boats on fire, and all the menfolk freak out and try to put it out. When that doesn't work, Jove does what he does best, and summons a massive thunderstorm to put out the fires instead. So, crisis averted, right? Well, yeah. But even Aeneas has to admit that all this sailing around is getting pretty old, so he gives the people too frail or too bored to continue sailing to Italy the option of staying and founding their own city right there in Sicily. So Aeneas, with a greatly reduced crew, sets off towards Italy once more. And this time around, to ensure that no more shenanigans happen, Neptune grants them safe passage straight to Italy. So yeah, Aeneas and the Trojans finally reach Cume, a city on the coast of Italy. Hey, they did it! <laughs> but since they don't actually know where Italy is or what it looks like, they don't realize they did it. You suck. So then... Christ. Then, Aeneas has to travel into the underworld. Sound familiar? Well, it should! So Aeneas descends into the underworld, all the dead Greeks flee him because clearly Aeneas was such a first-tier hero in the Iliad that every Achaean would know and fear him. And then he talks to his dad, Anchises, who tells him the prophecy. So according to the prophecy... Aeneas is destined to lead to the founding of a great city in Italy that will rise to become a great empire and usher in a worldwide golden age. For the record, the ones who actually do the heavy lifting are Aeneas' descendants, Romulus and Remus. So Aeneas pops back out of the underworld and they sail up the Italian coast to Latium, which Virgil tells us is currently ruled by King Latinus, who has a single daughter, Lavinia, who is currently being pursued by a ludicrous number of aspiring suitors. And if that one woman being pursued by a ludicrous number of aspiring suitors while her real husband is coming up the coast sounds familiar, well, it should. Of these suitors, the most desirable is a Latin bloke named Turnus. But Latinus is informed in a dream that his daughter shouldn't marry a Latin, but instead a foreigner. A very specific foreigner. Cut to Aeneas eating pizza on the beach. Okay, it's not pizza per se, but it is toppings on flatbread, so it's basically pizza. Anyway, one of Aeneas' men is like, Hey, check it out! We got so hungry we ate our bread table plate things! And Aeneas is like, oh, The prophecy! 
As you may recall, that harpy from earlier that we glossed over said they wouldn't find Italy until they ate their tables, and now they're in Italy sort of eating their sort of tables. And things just keep getting better for Aeneas, since as soon as Latinus lays eyes on him, he decides that the lad is the perfect foreigner to marry his daughter to. So that's it, right? Aeneas is destined to marry Lavinia, cause the founding of Rome, and then everything will kick ass forever? Well, yeah, but first there's this war thing. Yeah, remember how determined Juno was to ruin everything? Well, she's back. Juno sends a fury, Electo, to mess with Latinus' wife and make her oppose the marriage between Aeneas and Lavinia. Then Electo zips over to Turnus and infects him with the rage virus or something, and then it's off to where we go. Hey, that sounded pretty familiar, huh? So this is the part of the book where Virgil transitions seamlessly from shamelessly ripping off the Odyssey to shamelessly ripping off the Iliad. At this point, it'd be easier to list all the things in this war that don't directly parallel key events in the Trojan War. But that isn't my job, so here are all the things that could be generously described as mirroring key events in the Iliad. Aeneas gets a pretty hearty relationship going with this kid, Pallas, who's the son of this Arcadian king Evander. Their relationship is meant to emulate that of Achilles and Patroclus, albeit significantly less romantic. The war is initiated because of a woman being married to one man as opposed to a different man, due to the intervention of Venus, no less. Hephaestus, known by the Romans as Vulcan, no relation, forges Aeneas a shield. Sound familiar? Well, it should. Two Trojans embark on a nighttime stealth mission into the enemy camp. They end up dead, though, so that's a difference. Jove gets mad at the Olympians, Juno specifically, for screwing over the Trojans. Aeneas' buddy Pallas gets brutally murdered in a rather Patroclus-like way by the Hector-like enemy leader Turnus, who takes his gear. This prompts Aeneas into an Achilles-like rage, which is temporarily interrupted by... The suggestion that the war get resolved by a duel between the two leaders of the armies. After some shenanigans, they finally get them in the same place to try and kill each other, but that is interrupted because... A goddess intervenes and coaxes a soldier into chucking a spear at one of the leaders, provoking all-out war once again. Then Aeneas burns the unprotected enemy city to the ground. <laughs> hey, remember when he was really mad about that happening? Gotta love hypocrisy. And finally, Aeneas, enraged by the murder of his buddy Pallas and the fact that Turnus is wearing Pallas's gear, murders the now wounded and helpless enemy. Wonder what Hector thought of that. The combination of these last two events successfully transforms Aeneas into that which he hates the most, a cross between Achilles and Odysseus, which is a historical fanfiction all on its own, and more importantly, not one I'm remotely interested in. <laughs>